Reefer, Head of Events. Welcome to this Wired Sussex breakfast session on National Freelancer Day. Thank you so much to Plus Accounting for sponsoring this event. According to the Brighton Fuse report, 80% of companies in Brighton use freelancers and 94% of freelancers say that they prefer freelancing to being employed. 56% rate networking in Brighton as important and 51% feel part of a community here in Brighton. So clearly freelance designers, writers, programmers, and creatives are super important to the Brighton economy. So I'm delighted to introduce Juliet Zabar of Plugin Media and Alan Owen to talk to us today about all things freelance. Welcome, Juliet. Hello, everyone. I am Juliet from Plugin Media and I'm Managing Director of Plugin Media. I was a freelancer quite a long time ago in the 90s um, in a slightly different industry. I was a TV art director and then I went into digital media in around 2000 and I've been there ever since and was one of those freelancers who then developed into being uh, running a business and being a company director and kind of fell into it. And um, I'm going to have a discussion with Alan Owen, who has, um, who I've worked with. We were just talking about it since 2005, when he, um, sorry, he came to Plugin Media in 2005 as a freelance developer and artist. And I joined in 2006, and we first started working with Alan as a member of staff in 2007. And um, over many years um, we worked together he eventually became plugin media's technical director until 2018 when he decided to leave and pursue a freelance career so um, we thought we'd have a discussion that perhaps started off um, discussing the sort of differences between being a freelancer and having a staff job um, and so we thought we'd just start with a kind of few questions around a couple of topics um, Feel free to put any further questions into the chat and I'll, um, I'll, I'll try and take a look at those. Um, and also, I think um, what we want to do is also just share a few tips. So um, as we talk about these different areas, maybe um, in the chat, just share some of your own thoughts of how, um, how you've um, tackled some of the topics that we're talking about. I think that would be really helpful for everyone. Um, so first of all, I was going to ask Alan how he found um, being freelance after um, having had a staff job um, at Plugin. Yeah, um, so uh, I think like my, my story in the industry is quite a long one. And to answer that question, I kind of need to give a background, a bit of background. So um, when I started my career, um, I basically started freelancing because um, I, I did a, a degree in biology and I wanted to become an artist and those two things are incompatible. So I basically had to make a job for myself. Um, and I, I plotted a route whereby I would be a developer because that was kind of close to biology and then um, get close to artists and then learn their trade and then become an artist eventually. So I kind of, I got into the industry that way. And then um, freelancing was the first kind of, um, industrial placement that I had as it were because I couldn't find work anywhere and I thought I'll make a job for myself um, just by bothering people and um, building a portfolio but at that point my portfolio was mostly video games and interactive content so um, yeah like I, I was kind of born and bred in freelance so in answer to the question how I found it adjusting to being freelance it's I found it kind of a natural transition um, back into this thing but I found myself looking at it again in a different way um, because when I started freelancing, I had no kind of life experience. It was my first kind of um, industrial placement, like I say. But um, having then spent 10 years with plug-in media and um, being um, educated in the real world <laughs> professionally, I found that bringing that skill set back into freelancing made it a heck of a lot easier in a way and i felt a heck of a lot more competent with it and it felt um more um doable so um yeah i kind of there's there's a certain degree of fear associated with being a freelancer i could talk more about that in the context of a different question but um uh yeah so i'd say generally i found it okay adjusting like coming <laughs> um, home yeah I, I think that might be i think every freelance will have their own path through the industry and, and mine in particular is just you know, it's, freelancing is is 
back then it was a I need a job let's do freelancing now it's like I actually freelancing is a stable plateau that I can inhabit hopefully for 10 years or more it's it's like the the um the career path has led me here and I'm happy with it now it's rather than it being a stepping stone somewhere else it's now the place I want to be that was a long way of answering <laughs> so kind of on that point what would you say the kind of main differences on your sort of day-to-day -day life are is it a kind of endless nirvana of being your own boss and um it's not a nirvana um, work, work life balance <laughs> yeah i mean some bits are much improved from being a member of staff i think um so certainly for me but like when i was trying to break into the industry i i worked myself quite hard um and pushed myself a lot um and I still push myself, but I, looking back, I see that I push myself a bit too hard. So in terms of the, the changes that I make to myself, I'm a bit easier on myself now. Um, and that's it's a bit easier to be easier on myself because I'm not within this environment of kind of uh, peak stress, as it were, <laughs> at times. Um, and I'm able to do things like manage my own time a lot more uh, kind of productively. Um, but I'm a father. I wasn't a father when I started uh, freelancing. So I found when I had a child, it made my career kind of a lot more challenging, shall we say. And um, I found that only like since returning to freelancing, I kind of get how like it, being a parent and freelancing work together nicely in a way that being a full time employee and having a child are really, really difficult. Um, uh so yeah i think like my main changes would be around like lifestyle i'm a, a, a lot more kind of relaxed about things um but also i've um I, my my worldview has expanded a bit so I, I see things slightly differently now when i talk to clients like juliet and um you know other prospective clients out there i'm i'm seeing them kind of in a, a horizontal the relationship to horizontal one i'm seeing them as kind of people who um are wanting the same thing as me which is to run a business and yeah. that's a bit of a different outlook to being an employee and wanting to serve my employer yeah. it's like it, you're one step below there kind of <laughs> <laughs> this way it feels a lot more grown up and um, it's it, it's kind of moving into being a professional freelancer exactly yeah it's, it's kind of formalized that professional mindset um i'm, I'm no longer an aspirant i'm a professional <laughs> yeah um, so kind of one of the things that I'm really interested in um, is the way in which kind of freelancers can kind of sh sort of hold a mirror up to your own um, company and organization. And um, obviously you have continued to work with us on a freelance basis, but you've also gone into other companies and work there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about um, how it feels um, and what you do to kind of integrate into a, a different company's culture and mm -hmm. how different they each feel. Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question because every company is different. And one of the things that I noticed quite early on was I was so set in my ways from having been employed with Plugin for a decade. I thought, you know, and everything working so well at Plugin, I thought that everyone's like that, right? This is the professional standard. Nowhere else is like that. Everywhere else is kind of slightly wonky in their own way. <laughs> and, and I kind of realized now that, um, you know, there are no rules. Every director manages the things to the best of their abilities um so yeah sorry what was the question was it what, what well, just sense? how yeah how what and is there anything that you do if you're taking oh, on the and you have to so, kind of understand a whole new culture what yeah, do you do to kind of integrate having learned that lesson um one of the first things that i tried to do when i started out freelancing was to to kind of show up for work in the office of my new client and just behave like an employee like i used to because that's what i knew um and that felt like the right thing to do to kind of you know pacify my employer let them know that i'm busy and doing what i'm meant to be doing um and being professional about it um and then i quickly realized that that wasn't necessary because um the structures of the places that i was going to weren't expecting freelancers to, to show up and occupy a desk like an employee the relationship they had with freelancers was quite different and it was like no you're over there and then the work comes back every so often when it's done. So I, I've kind of adapted to that lifestyle like, along with COVID because COVID happened and it's forced everyone to work remotely. It's kind of felt natural to, 
to kind of start working remotely. So yeah, I've tried to bring a certain amount into organizations and the industry has corrected me and said, no, we don't need that. You're a freelancer. You can, you know, we trust you to be a bit more professional independently. I think, you know, I think there is quite a big difference there and I'm sure there's a big difference without knowing how other organisations work, but I'm sure um, it is kind of interesting to see how some organisations expect people to, freelancers to work on site, they really want them to feel part of the team and others can kind of put you to one side and say, mm -hmm. well, actually, you're, you're here to work on this job and um, we don't need you to integrate. Um, It'd be really nice if anyone's got any experiences or kind of ideas that they of things that they've done. Um, just do pop them in the chat or ask a question about them. Um, I mean, generally, Alan, do you find you get treated quite differently to being a staff member? Um, yeah, I think um, I remember when I was um, working with Plugin and employing freelancers. Um, I used to kind of see them swanning in like rock stars. <laughs> And I resented them for that attitude. And I, I now see that they were just chilled out because they didn't have the same stress. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think there was a degree of that, certainly one company I worked for, naming no names, but like I remember feeling, like I went in there to present myself and be professional and I just met a brick wall. And it was, it was better off me just not being there. And um, so I, I kind of felt a bit, um, not included per se but then it's maybe it was wrong of me to expect to be included as a freelancer like one of the mindsets that i'm in as a freelancer is there are no rules like every contact and contract is unique in their own way and one of the skills is figuring out what this person wants but always maintaining my own professional integrity yeah so what kind of you know what's your preferred sort of organizational attitude and culture or or preferred boss to work for is it um i guess there's possibly a kind of scale between complete yeah. independence and sort of micromanagement yeah you know where where do you fall on that and what do you enjoy most and what do you ex what makes a good good freelance boss um the best freelance boss is somebody who has not necessarily someone who's hired freelancers before because they might just be making the same mistakes every time i think somebody that um has a degree of professionalism themselves is the best person to work for people who have um worked hard at um developing their business and cares about their own staff generally cares for their freelancers as well um what i like as a freelancer is autonomy so somebody who trusts and doesn't micromanage um uh, a good judge of character makes a good employee because um uh, sorry employer because if they can within a few conversations kind of get that you're professional and competent they're happy to leave you alone and you know let you get on with it but there are there are other types who are a bit more like i'm paying you by the hour for this you know you can make sure it's right have you done it yet you know let's just make sure that it's perfect that's a bit challenging i don't really like to work under those circumstances but um, yeah autonomy to be a professional uh, that's the best kind of uh, sure, sure. And I think, you know, one of the big challenges and, um, you know, that I, th I think you've spoken about this before, Alan, is just that idea of being a craftsperson and being yeah. an expert in your field. But that's not really enough if you're a freelancer because you also no. have some business skills. Um, so I wondered, you know, how you found all of a sudden you were having to um, market yourself and prepare quotes for clients and suddenly... Mm operate as a micro business as opposed to uh, someone with just a project that they need to look at yeah i mean these are the these are this is really interesting because i think what um certainly i look around me and my, my peers are all craftspeople in their own way they're artists or designers or developers or sound engineers or you know all these different kind of crafts where you can go really deep and be really really good at it but that doesn't make you a good freelancer um what makes a good freelancer is excellent craftsmanship, but then this whole layer of business acumen, and that extends between um, interpersonal relationships with other businesses, into your own financial um, acumen, uh, into like organisational management. Um, so I, I, I find myself doing a heck of a lot more project management than I'd ever been, um, you know, content doing, shall we say. Um, and going into freelancing, I never thought I'll have to be a project manager as well as a software engineer. 
now I look at it and it's like, oh, oh I became a project manager. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm still um, concentrating deeply on my skill set, which is, you know, HTML5 game development. And yes. so, yeah, I found it's definitely a broadening of horizons becoming freelance. Um, but to, to kind of put it in a really positive way, I mean, like the, what I wanted to do when I left plugin was um, grow some more. And I've definitely found that I felt like um, it, there's a degree of independence that I've earned through the process of freelancing and facing all these challenges I didn't know that I would have to face. Um, but just dealing with them day by day, bit by bit. And now looking back, like it was three years ago that I, I left plugin and I had a so I did different idea about freelancing then. I thought it might be kind of a small gap in between work whilst I aspired to, you know, go deep into some other craft. But it's it's worked out as it has and I've just followed the path. And it's it's fun to kind of look back and see that I have grown <laughs> but in ways that I didn't anticipate. Um, so yeah, so there's obviously all that signs of sort of project managing yeah. as well as doing your craft. And then how do you find the sort of business development and the finding new work side of things? That's been really interesting. Um, when I started freelancing, I, my, most of my efforts and attention were into how am I going to find work? Um, and now looking back in the last three years, it's been right at the bottom of the stack. It's not the thing that I ever had to worry about at all. Um, because I haven't had to chase people and I haven't had to wave my portfolio in front of people um, because uh, LinkedIn has served me very well um, and I don't know how people are finding me via LinkedIn but they are <laughs> um, and I get a lot of contacts through that and I've had some very good contacts that have yielded new contacts who have yielded new contacts and it's just been this kind of um, snowballing effect and that's really the way to to go so um yeah like cultivating networks i would say is the best way of finding work and um juliet you mentioned about like being generous with time i'm i, I tend to if somebody contacts me to say are you available to do such and such and i know that i can't i'll say i can't but you know if you have any questions about this thing or you need some help finding someone, I'm, I'm happy to help with that because I gain the experience for kind of practicing at this new contact and they get the experience for, um, you know, like borrowing my skill set to find someone. And the next time around, they come back to me and they say, you were helpful, you know, are you available? Yeah, I, I might be available. So things have progressed in that way. And that's a very kind of organic way of developing you know, new projects rather than me going out and making something amazing and smashing it on LinkedIn and saying, look at me, I'm amazing. Yeah. I've not had to do that, thankfully. Um, we um, have each got some kind of tips from both the employer and the freelancer's perspective, but I was wondering, um, before we just go into those, whether there was anything that we'd said that anyone had any questions about, or um, if there was anything that had piqued your interest, or you do things differently that you wanted to share. Is, is anyone up for that? No? Yes? No? <laughs> I'm assuming everyone's a freelancer. <laughs> Hopefully they, they, they found that kind of interesting. Um, sorry, I don't want to make, make people speak if they don't want to, but um, we'll move on to our tips and see if there's anything um, there. I think, um, I'm sure we've covered a lot of this, but um, so we each sort of came up with sort of five um, recommendations. And um, my first one really was about um, it, you know, it's it's about scope of work, and um, I think this is probably everyone's. You know, we have we do a lot of client work, and it's the, it's the biggest challenge in client work is identifying what's in scope and what's out of scope, and that kind of feeds through into the staff on your project being clear when they estimate. And so for me, that's really really important. And I'd rather have a proposal that had a very, very long list of what's in and out than a, a single page saying five days, X amount of money. So for me, that's a really important point. Um, secondly, I think it's really important to understand the culture um, of the organization that you're working with. Um, we always used to say we wanted our freelancers to work on site. Um, now, um, with COVID, remote working's become so much more of the norm, but um, some FaceTime is still so important. And um, 
And yeah, I, I kind of am slightly jealous of that freelancer perspective of being in, being able to go into other organisations and 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 see what makes them tick. And I think um, trying to understand that benefits both sides of the relationship. Um, and kind of um, yeah, on that point, really, I think um, I've had some really great stories of freelancers going into new organisations and suggesting different ways of doing things. And I think if you're coming into a different organisation and you're observing that things are being doing one way, but you've got a much better way to do things, then you know we, as an employer, I'd really love to hear that because um, yeah, you're the ones with it with the broad perspectives. Um, I think it's really important, as Alan was just saying, to be be generous with your time. I'm not saying you need to give everything away for free, but you know, if it's a question of a phone call and a uh, a quick question about a project or how you might approach something, um, I do think that pays benefits for the freelancer. Certainly, if someone's um, given me some advice or um, um, a little bit of kind of information on how to approach something, I'm much more likely to go back to that freelancer for work. Um, and, you know, in terms of that being a point of loyalty, um, you know, I, I do expect loyalty from, from staff and freelancers alike. And, and if we have people who are being loyal to us, then, then we'll absolutely be loyal back to them. Um, so those were my tips. Al, I know you've got a few as well. Yeah, I've got a couple of um, I might shorten them though, because there's a couple of questions that are kind of relevant to the tips that yeah. I give anyway. Um, so I think tip number one, um, fear, freelance fear, um, never goes away. And my main tip for that, um, because I found that it does actively reduce the fear to a point where it's manageable, <laughs> is to, to track your leads, track your contacts, and to kind of track the rhythm of the industry. So I've got this spreadsheet where whenever someone emails me or sends a LinkedIn message, I record like when it happened, like what date, who it was, who they represent, what they wanted, and then what I did as a result. And that's kind of a passive process, but I can look back on that spreadsheet and see how big it's grown. And then that gives me confidence that there is work out there. It's not a problem. Like when I've got no work and I've got to grow, I'm gonna get some money next month. Like it, there is work out there. And there is also now a contacts list who I could prospectively approach and say, hey, you know, I helped you out doing such and such. I'm now available. How did it go? Do you want some help with that? Um, yeah, so that's that's the way that, again, it's the organic process of growing leads. It's rather than this passive ego driven, here's my stuff, wait for work. It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, or maybe it does in some industries, not, <laughs> not here. Um, the other, I'll only give one other tip because I, I want to answer these questions. Um, and that's to do with finances. Um, a lot of people, you know, say oh, freelancing, you know, you've got to be self-assessed. How do you deal with that? It's not complicated at all. Um, uh, lots of people I know use accountants and stuff like that. And I think if I were a limited company, I might try that. I'm a um, sole trader, which works fine. And self-assessment is very, very easy. There's only three kind of bits of data that you need to track. And so long as you're able to spreadsheet all of that stuff, by the time the kind of tax day comes around, it's, you just read off the values and it's done. So it's, it's don't be put off by self-assessment. There's like another thing that you have to do as well as your trade craft to get into freelancing and all the other stuff. Um, so I've got two questions. One um, on how I value myself. Do I charge per hour or per value of the project? Is it hard, is it hard to do? It's a really interesting question. So um, I have a day rate, um, which I, um, if I work kind of less than a day, divide by the number of hours per day which tends to be between seven and eight depending on how um complicated working for that client is <laughs> he says sensitively um and yeah i don't find it difficult to do because um my work is a combination of massive long projects that take three months and bitty bits of work that take a couple of hours every now and then um and i tend to kind of thread the two together there was a point earlier on in my career where I was like, oh, I'll only ever do one project at a time and concentrate on that. And that's the ideal. But the reality is that people want stuff. And if you want to keep your network going, you've got to serve the clients as they come in. Um, so yeah, kind of a combination of charging per hour, a combination of charging per day. The hourly rate is a function of the day rate divided by seven or eight. Um, do you find you need to be quite a good judge of your client as well? Because yes, you know, yeah, I do. And the 
it's difficult to gauge a client with a short conversation. You kind of need to work for them to know what it's like. Um, I mean, I would say from our pitching process, when we're pitching for larger projects, I always want a negotiation rather than I, I, I hate the idea of being judged on my first cost. It's like yeah, yeah. with a freelancer, I would, um, you know, if it was too much, then I'd mm. be much more inclined to go back and say, well, what can you do here? Or yeah. what exactly mm. does this involve? Or can we put some aside as contingency or, you yeah. know, work in a different way? That's right. So, uh, I mean, the estimate is based on a scope. Um, so I'm talking about interactive development here. So there's a certain number of features and a certain brief that needs to be. The brief breaks into features. The features are what I estimate. If the estimate comes out too big, then we discuss the scope. Um, because the scope is variable, my day rate is also depending on how nice the client is and how likely repeat business is and all these kind of woolly, fluffy things that you just can't, there's no rules. You just have to decide, um, you know, what benefits me right now. Um, so yeah, there's, there's flexibility in, in different domains. And I guess yeah. like part of freelancing is identifying that is even a thing because, you know, I'm I'm speaking it now, but I didn't know that going into freelancing. Yeah. That I would need to yeah. faff with these kind of business skills. So um, Simon's asked a question: Are there online forums where yeah. freelancing get work can be found? Um, one of my one of my top tips was stay well clear of Fiverr and the other one. I, they are so depressing. Um, I've had dark moments when I've you know this is prior to me having my list of contacts and kind of keeping a finger on the industry pulse as it were and like having the fear and the fear grows to a point where you're like let's go on Fiverr and you have a look on Fiverr and there are kids in Latvia charging a pound an hour to do what you do and you're like I'm out <laughs> it's just it's so depressing um, so yeah they're, they're they're probably okay um, I entertain the thought of kind of getting into art still and one thing I might experiment with one day is going on Fiverr just to kind of try earning some experience in that domain. So it has its value. And I think, yeah, if I were an artist, you might be able to cultivate um, contacts there. But they're different kinds of contacts. They would be international contacts who have different expectations. Um, I've been lucky enough to kind of work with relatively local contacts in the UK for doing my professional work. Um, so yeah, identifying the difference between those two and knowing it's a thing and just don't be pulled into Fiverr. That Fiverr is not the standard by a long shot. It's a depressing, low paid. I, I, don't, I don't know that platform, but um, we will typically use Wired Sussex Jobs Board. Mm. We use, um, and there's a great Facebook group for animation, jobs. Um, and yeah, LinkedIn has become so it comes so much into its own since COVID. Yeah. It's been amazing. The, the, the power of LinkedIn, I think, is really quite remarkable. But there is still a fair bit of of word of mouth. And as I say, our freelancers quite often are people that have been loyal to us for a long time, and we've been loyal to them. Um, another question here. I know we've got to wrap up, but maybe a final question from Mark. Um, is it worthwhile, maybe early on, to take on work, even if it's not the kind of work you're looking for? Um, if it's offered to you, or do you hold out for the perfect project? This is a really interesting question. Um, uh, because I would say, I would counter that by saying that the perfect project isn't the one where you're making the video game for the TV show that you like. The perfect project is the one where you know what you're doing, you are confident that it can be done, you're being paid fairly, and your client is wonderful to work with. Like the perfect project is um, is not the product, it's the process. Uh, and that's one of the things that I'm kind of increasingly seeing, like process is important, way more important than product. And for a professional to be doing their job well and the client to respect that the work is being done well and reward them for it, um, you know, that's that's all you can ever hope for. So, yeah, I would say like seek seek that relationship rather than seek the project that is the dream project. It's more of a, certainly like this is with my long-term outlook, like doing freelance properly, I'll be doing freelancing forever. And if I'm doing it forever, I need to be enjoying it, right? So the, the process is the goal. It's, it's um, optimizing the process to the point where it's wonderful every time. That's the goal. It's not delivering the the ultimate video game for the ultimate client. No, no that's, yeah. That, that would be my answer. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like a good time to, it's a good note to, to yeah. end on. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you so much to Juliet and Alan, and thank you to my, our sponsors, Plus Accounting.